So if you've watched my old review on Insurgency Sandstorm or follow me on Twitter, you've probably got the impression that I'm not a fan of Call of Duty. Yes, I hate on that game a lot, but to be honest, I only really have problems with the post-World War II games like Modern Warfare and Black Ops. The reasons are manifold. I don't like the way they seem to be increasingly made for the sake of multiplayer. I hate the whole press F to win mechanics and the fact that sometimes they're so scripted they feel like rail shooters. I'm also a big story guy and I hate the way the military is portrayed in these games. They're like over the top action movies, but they take themselves so seriously. And if you know anything about Russia, and I do since I spent more than a decade there, the plot, especially in Modern Warfare 2, is just idiotic beyond words. And I could do an entire video just explaining everything that's wrong with the basic premise in Modern Warfare 2 and 3, especially when it comes to Russia. Oh, and there's this. And that's where I come in. Yeah, that did not age too well. Okay, so you get my point. But recently, circumstances led me to start playing the old school original Call of Duty PC games. And not only did it bring back a lot of fond memories, but it also reminded me why those games got so successful in the first place. The bridge backstory behind my Call of Duty nostalgia binge was that I was working on my first anti verbu video, which you should definitely check out. And I had to do a ton of research for that and the upcoming series. Now, I'm no stranger to this topic. I've been studying Second World War history since I was 14. But in the past seven or so years, I pretty much abandoned the subject entirely. And so not only did I have to refresh my memory by reading stuff I'd already read years ago, but I also had to catch up with the latest historical research that had been done during that time. The problem is that even when reading new literature, you end up having to go over a lot of ground you've already covered, which can make things a little boring. It may seem weird, but I got this idea that maybe I could rekindle my interest in the topic by playing some of my favorite World War II video games, and Call of Duty naturally came to mind. And I have to say, I think it worked. For the record, I first started playing Call of Duty in 2005, maybe 2006 on the Xbox. One of those games was Call of Duty 2 Big Red 1, and I regret that I can't show you that here because it was a console exclusive. But suffice to say, I was pretty impressed. But soon I moved overseas and initially settled in Russia. And in that first year, the original PC Call of Duty and its expansion pack, United Offensive, were two of my best friends. See, that was a year when I lived in a small town and didn't have internet in my flat. Didn't make much money either. In fact, I didn't even have a washing machine, but that's another story entirely. Now, the cool thing at the time was that people in the marketplaces sold pirate video games and movies. And so for under $10, I was able to buy a disc with Call of Duty, United Offensive, and some miscellaneous mods on it. About a year and a half later, I played Call of Duty 2, and after that, I played Call of Duty World at War. While I was making my first anti verbu video, I played through all of these titles again for old time's sake. And like I said before, it really served as a reminder to why this series got so successful in the first place. Also, recently I've seen opinions that suggest the series, despite some reboots, has been in decline. And I think looking back at the series' roots can be instructive as to what went wrong. Who knows, maybe the next great game developer will see this video and bring about a renaissance in World War II first-person shooters. Probably not, though. All right, I'm not going to do a deep dive into the history of Call of Duty's development. Basically, it was made by some people who had worked on Medal of Honor Allied Assault. Part of a then wildly successful World War II themed first person shooter series originally launched on the first PlayStation. I'd actually played Medal of Honor Frontline back in 2002, which was basically a console port of this for PlayStation 2. It's been nearly 20 years since then, but what I vaguely remember is that apart from the Omaha Beach mission, you're more often than not fighting on your own, much like in any other first person shooter of the era. Even by the early 21st century, AI allies and FPSs were often totally incompetent, getting either you or themselves killed, blocking your line of fire, or getting stuck on things. As such, it made it hard to make believable large-scale combat. You were limited to things like small squads, or if the game was set in a large conflict like World War II, secret commando stuff, not terribly realistic. But then the programmers at the then new studio called Infinity Ward undid the Gordian Knot. Using an enhanced version of the Quake 3 engine, they developed new AI pathfinding mechanics that would not only make for more intelligent and coordinated enemies, but also allies as well. Now, the Second World War first-person shooter would no longer be Half-Life with German soldiers instead of aliens. Now, it could be a battle. And besides this, the developers did make an honest effort to try to make the game more historically authentic. And while I could easily nitpick these games' accuracy all day if need be, for the most part they managed to achieve this sort of good enough level of authenticity where I can turn a blind eye to most of the historical failings. I, I can do that. That is a thing I can do. I'm totally fine with there being STG-44s in the Battle of Stalingrad. It's just a video game. Okay, let's just get into it. 
So I'm gonna lump Call of Duty and United Offensive in together. And right off the bat, the biggest things Call of Duty brought to popular FPS gaming was the ability to aim down sights. Technically, it wasn't the first game where you could do this, but Call of Duty actually encouraged and popularized it. And thus the game always felt very distinct from earlier shooters where you just used a crosshair. Now you not only needed to reload, but you also had to draw a bead on enemies, meaning you had to advance carefully and use cover, otherwise you'd be facing a hail of bullets without being able to effectively fight back. What is nice about the combat though is that it's more realistic in the sense that you don't really encounter bullet spongy enemies at all. Damage can be a bit random at times and enemies can get wounded and recover to keep fighting. But generally if you take aim and hit a soldier center mass with the M1 Grand, he's going down in one shot. So when engaging enemies popping up behind windows or from trench lines, the game has a sort of whack-a-mole shooting gallery quality that was very different from first person shooters of that day. One last critical development the game brought to the table was the careful design of levels to distract from the fact that you're in an FPS game rather than on an open battlefield. Some of the levels are absolutely huge, but when the game needs to restrict your movement, it does so with marked minefields. This allows for big, expansive outdoor areas while keeping the player on track. Although Call of Duty had multiplayer, it had a long, well-developed single-player campaign in which you'd play as an ordinary soldier in the US Army, the British Army, and finally the Red Army. That last bit was critical because up to then it wasn't common to see anything about the German-Soviet War in Western pop culture. Everything was D-Day or Pearl Harbor, while the massive, most brutal battles in history were almost totally ignored. Call of Duty, quote, fixed this, mainly by ripping off the 2001 film Enemy at the Gates, a well it would come back to many, many times. Yeah, it could have been a lot better, but the ability to play through something resembling the Battle of Stalingrad, wielding a Papa Shah 41, was both novel and exciting at the time. You boot up the game to the menu, where you're greeted with that schmaltzy, emotional Spielberg movie score, the kind that tells you that this is a serious and respectful World War II game. The basic structure of the game is you play through an American campaign, then the British one, then the Soviet one, and finally you play a short series of single missions for each side, until you finally storm the Reichstag and help plant the red flag. Most of the missions are Require you to get from point A to B, usually blowing up some objectives along the way. And in some missions, you have to hold a certain area or structure until reinforcements arrive to relieve you. After that, you'll normally regroup with your commander, who tells you he's really proud of you, unlike your parents. This happens throughout the early series, and it's really encouraging. I am extremely proud of all of you. The American campaign kicks off with an in-game tutorial that gets you used to the mechanics of moving in combat. Apart from the aiming down sights, which I already mentioned, you can also go prone in the early Call of Duty series. And that actually comes in handy quite a bit, which we'll discuss later. After the tutorial, you find yourself dropping into Normandy as a Pathfinder in the 101st Airborne, also known as the Screaming Eagles, also known as the airborne unit that filmmakers and video game designers all love because they have an eagle on their patch, unlike America's first and best airborne division that's still actually an airborne division. Okay, irritation aside, I have to say I like this decision to start with the airborne component of Operation Overlord, because Medal of Honor had already done a D-Day mission, and of course it was Omaha Beach. Everything's Omaha Beach. And yes, other Call of Duty games would do this later, and of course they'd rip off Saving Private Ryan in the process, but at least this game ripped off Band of Brothers, which I enjoyed a lot more than Saving Private Ryan. After landing, you set up a beacon and the invasion begins. The skies fill with planes and more paratroopers start dropping. Now it's a battle. Later, you'll have to fight to defend the town of San Mariglis. Incidentally, this town was actually liberated by paratroopers from, that's right, the 82nd. But to the game's credit, some of the paratroopers you fight with have 82nd patches, and the Normandy airborne operation was famously plagued by mist drops that ended up working in the Allies' favor as the Germans believed the invaders to be everywhere at once, and thus had trouble consolidating their defense. After this, you go through a short, scripted, on-rails section before you take part in the famous assault on the German artillery position at Brecor Manor, which was portrayed in the second episode of Band of Brothers. At this point, things go a little off the rails because your unit is supposedly pulled out of the line for a special mission behind enemy lines. Way behind the lines. Yes, the next few missions are absolutely ridiculous as you infiltrate a German mansion and a POW camp to rescue two British prisoners. Sadly, this theme of starting out more or less historical and then going straight up dirty dozen action film is a recurring one in this game and the series. Next, you find yourself in the British campaign where you play as gliderborne infantry from the British 6th Airborne Division, assaulting the bridge at Benouville which would later become known as Pegasus Bridge. This was a special operation within the larger Normandy invasion, and incidentally, the British troops actually landed before the American Airborne Divisions. 
The mission is portrayed fairly accurately as your glider crash lands close to German positions, yet the German sentries are unaware of your presence. This actually happened. One of the gliders bounced along the ground and finally came to a halt about 40 meters from the nearest German sentry positions guarding the bridge, and the pilot and co-pilot were actually ejected from the glider as the cockpit collapsed on impact. Bloody hell. But not only did they survive, but the sentries were in fact totally unaware, and the rest of the German garrison remained asleep. After securing the bridge, you have to defend it in the morning, much like the actual mission. If you take the time to look at aerial photographs of the bridge and the surrounding German positions, you'll see the devs did a pretty good job of getting it right. You really have to credit them for that. Once again, the plot goes a bit off the rails as your character ends up in a commando unit sabotaging a German dam. I do like the fact that there's a nod to Operation Chastise in this. You might have heard of the so-called dam busters. Anyway, after that, you escape in a truck and it's a bit of a frustrating on rail segment, but you'll get through it after a few tries. Lastly, there's another unrealistic mission that has you infiltrating and sabotaging the German battleship Tirpitz. That one I really could have done without. The good news is that you're done with the British campaign at that point, and you can move on to the Red Army campaign, which, apart from some things I'm going to cover right off the bat, at least doesn't rapidly turn into crazy commando missions hundreds of kilometers behind German lines. All right, I'm just going to put it out here right now. Remember when I said the devs apparently did some research into some of the battles you play through in the American and British campaigns? Well, for the Red Army campaign, the loading screen text tells you they read something, but beyond that, it looks like they just watch Enemy at the Gates. I'm not an expert in IP law, but I'm floored at how throughout the wildly successful series, Call of Duty has repeatedly ripped off things almost shot for shot from movies like Enemy at the Gates and Saving Private Ryan, and seemingly they have suffered zero legal repercussions from it. And I know earlier I said I could close my eyes to the game's historical inaccuracies, but when it comes to Stalingrad, I can't remain silent. I'm sorry, it's just too important for me. Prepare to get educated. To be fair, the loading screens actually try to give you some detailed information. You're a soldier in the 13th Guards Rifle Division, one of the most important units during the battle for the city itself. First problem though, you start off in an enemy at the gates ripoff scene, crossing the Volga in broad daylight, about three days after the division had actually crossed into the city. In real life, these crossings were made at night for reasons which ought to be obvious. An advanced detachment of the 13th Guards did cross over in daylight at 1700 on 14th September, but this was by necessity, as the Germans had already nearly managed to take the central landing docks at that point, which would have been disastrous. Just like an enemy at the gates, your fellow soldiers are unarmed and huddling like scared rabbits. While the 13th Guards Rifle Division had suffered casualties in the early summer fighting near Kharkiv, and thus had received fresh replacements, the division was based around the remnants of an elite airborne brigade commanded by Alexander Radimtsev. That unit had acquitted itself very well during the otherwise disastrous battle for Kyiv the previous year, and thus by the time of Stalingrad, any survivors from that period much like Radimtsev himself, would have been very experienced, hardened troops, and good mentors and leaders for the new replacements. In any case, Radimtsev insisted on making the crossing with that first initial detachment, and he steeled his troops with rousing speeches rather than threats. The first troops suffered horrendous casualties during the daylight crossing, and Radimtsev's own ferry was hit, killing most of those aboard. A lot of these details have been left out of official Soviet post-war accounts, which didn't let on how desperate the Red Army's position in Stalingrad had become. All right, this, this fucking thing. This never happened, at least not at Stalingrad. I vaguely remember reading something about this kind of thing years before I saw Enemy at the Gates when it was released in 2001. I'm fairly certain it was from some popular German memoir, but many years later I read somewhere that the myth may have come from a misunderstanding of something in the division commander Radimtsev's memoirs. He'd written something about several hundred to a thousand of his men not having rifles when they arrived at the staging area on the eastern bank of the Volga. From my own recent research, I found that although the first contingent of troops that went over in daylight had gone without some of their heavy weapons, the rest of the division was fully supplied with arms and ammo they needed by the evening of the 14th. In other words, the rest of the division was fully equipped before it crossed the Volga. Also, recently I heard about a very similar scenario involving Nikolai Batyuk, commander of the 284th Rifle Division. Batyuk showed up with only one regiment fully armed and equipped. So, what do you think he did? Hint, not this. Get ready to be floored at this level of tactical genius, but Batyuk actually sent the regiment that had weapons and equipment across the Volga
Volga into the city on the 21st of September and held those other two under-equipped regiments on the friendly side of the Volga until the next day when they had received all their weapons and were thus ready to cross over into the city. Yes, instead of uselessly squandering men by sending all the unarmed soldiers along with the one armed regiment to pick up rifles from the fallen, he just waited a day so the regiments would be fully armed and equipped. Surely Bachuk was a master of the art of war. Now we get to the next thing ripped off from Enemy at the Gates, that is the Commissars shooting soldiers retreating from a failed attack. I'm not going to go into great detail here, but suffice to say, Stalin's infamous Not a Step Back Order 227 did entail creating so-called blocking detachments, but they were not intended to shoot soldiers for taking cover or retreating from failed attacks. And here's an interesting little fact. The actual text of the order cites the German army during the Moscow counteroffensive in December 1941 as the inspiration both for creating penal battalions and blocking detachments. And the latter were formally done away with by October 1942, roughly three months after the order had been issued. Many commanders didn't even bother creating blocking units, and it's not hard to find memoirs of soldiers who encountered such detachments during the time they were active. But you won't read about them gunning down troops, retreating from failed attacks, or retreating in good order from overwhelming German attackers. One story I personally read involved a group of retreating soldiers being challenged by a blocking detachment and they simply told the truth that they'd run out of ammo. They were then sent on their merry way to the rear. Believe me, the Soviet government would do a lot of terrible things to some of its most dedicated soldiers during and after the war, but mowing them down like this just wasn't one of them. Okay, lesson over. Once you get past the enemy at the gates ripoff part, the Red Army campaign actually gets pretty good. You get to do a lot of sniper action, but also there's plenty of close quarters, room to room combat that lets you go to town on the Nazis with the rapid fire Papa Shaw 41 Brat Gun. <laughs> The Stalingrad campaign culminates in a defense of Pavlov's house, and let me say on higher difficulty levels, this gets near impossible without just camping in a safe spot about halfway through and running out the clock till reinforcements arrive. There are just too many German soldiers flooding into the house from every entrance, and your few squad mates aren't enough to handle them all. The best advice I can give here is make sure you know the location of the two anti-tank rifles in the building, and the best route to get from one to the other. Next, you'll skip ahead to the January 1945 offensive through Poland, and after fighting through a factory, you'll actually get to command a T-34-85 tank. The tank levels in these games are much better than the on-rail segments, because you do actually get to control the tank yourself. Finally, you have a couple short missions with the other allies, including one with the British commandos who have to destroy a V-2 rocket launch site. And then it's on to Berlin for the final battle atop the Reichstag. Don't expect to get a shocking reveal in the ending, but at least Hitler's dead, and that's always a good thing. Now, because United Offensive is an expansion pack, I'll talk about it before giving my final ruling on the first Call of Duty as a whole. United Offensive once again gives you campaigns from the American, British, and Soviet POV, but it adds a lot of content. Most of that content is new weapons, but what's very useful is a sprint function. One improvement I really liked was the addition of some allied machine guns like the Soviet DP-28 and the Browning 30 cal with deployable bipod. For some reason in the original game, they never bothered to model any machine gun save for the MG-42, which gets a bit weird in some parts. As for the campaign, you once again start with the American 101st Airborne, but this time you're in the Ardennes at Boston. 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 During the Battle of the Bulge, and it's basically more Band of Brothers. Not that it's bad, though. There's just this one super annoying part with a bridge where you have almost no cover and have no choice but to run through a storm of lead. The campaign's a good mix of attacking, rail shooter, and defending. The British campaign kicks off really differently. You're a gunner on a B-17 bomber. Yes, I don't know why they didn't choose a British bomber like, you know, the Lancaster. The US did provide the UK with B-17s, but as I understand, they were mostly used for coastal defense and not strategic bombing. Not like in this game. In any case, you end up blasting an absurd amount of Messerschmitts out of the sky before your bomber is shot down and you manage to bail out over occupied Netherlands. There, you'll meet an operative from the Special Operations Executive and a group of Dutch resistance fighters whom you'll help destroy a rail bridge. After that, the commandos are so impressed with you, you end up joining them on a Guns of Navarone-style mission in the Mediterranean theater. It's a fairly action-packed mission that concludes with a motorcycle chase and a boat chase. Then it's back to the Red Army, but this time you're at the Battle of Kursk. After defending against a German attack on your lines and liberating a village, you'll get another tank section inspired by the Battle of Prokhorovka. After that, you'll take part in the fourth and final Battle of Kharkiv, the one where the Red Army finally and permanently retook the city. If you like the urban combat of the Stalingrad level in the original game, you'll like this. 
The only flaw specific to United Offensive, in my opinion, is that it's short, first of all. I also ran into an issue of being critically short of ammunition for my starting weapons in the first few Red Army missions. And there's another annoying problem that comes up in those missions as well. In United Offensive, a lot of your fellow Red Army soldiers are wearing the padded cotton telegreca jackets. Which is odd given that it's summer, but worse still, the color the devs went with is this light gray green that makes them sometimes look like the Germans. I should note that while it's possible to accidentally shoot friendly soldiers in this game without repercussion, doing it too much will lead to a mission fail. As far as real flaws in both this and the base game, well, let's start with the worst. In this game, you're up against tons of enemies wielding hit scan weapons, and so cover is naturally very important. The problem is that unlike in real life, it can often be difficult in the game to determine whether or not you're fully in cover, and if you're not, the slightest pixel of your player character can be fired at and hit repeatedly. Basically, you will spend a lot of time getting shot even when you think you're in cover. This can be a real problem in some parts where enemy soldiers spawn until you trigger something and you have limited health items in the vicinity. The best you can do to mitigate this is to be very careful when choosing cover and getting to it, and also go prone to take advantage of smaller cover or the micro terrain. Another issue is the way the game gives you ammo. There's nothing like supply crates where you can just refill your ammo, and the only way to acquire ammunition is to pick up the exact same weapon as the one you're holding. So if you want to keep using your player country's weapons, you may find yourself needing to scrounge ammo from dead comrades. Otherwise, in some longer missions, you'll need to start using enemy weapons. You might say the game is kind of linear, but I found that isn't entirely true. On my most recent playthrough, I found myself taking routes I didn't remember using before, and the game does seem to reward you for exploration with extra health and ammo. Other than that, for its time it was a great game, and in some ways it's more fun and easier to jump right into than some of the later games in the series. It uses a checkpoint system, but thankfully it also has a manual save feature. Though historical inaccuracies abound, Many of the vehicles, weapons, uniforms, and even the terrain are lovingly crafted to a respectable level of authenticity. And I think best of all, I had a really good time playing through this again, even though it's been so many years. In part two of this series, we'll discuss the first big true sequel, Call of Duty 2, and the spin-off, World at War. Both incorporated features that have become more or less standard in FPSs for about a decade now, Though at least one of those has somewhat fallen out of favor recently. Till then, subscribe so you'll know about that right away when it comes out. But also, I'd like to hear your thoughts on the original Call of Duty series. Maybe your first impressions of it, your nostalgic reminiscences, or even historical nitpicking I might have missed. I'm always up for something like that. And as always, check the description below to see the link to my Patreon page. And that's it. So until the next video, dear viewers.